Thanks so much. Uh, those of you that are really observant might have noticed something this morning. You might have noticed that we haven't had just one screen working. We haven't just had two screens working, but for the first time for a number of weeks, we've had all three screens working. And Norman and Neil have spent hours in the building one way or another because something that you might not have noticed, because last week this building, this room was really super cosy. We haven't got just one room that's super warm. <laughs> we haven't just got two rooms in Linda's office, or three rooms in Ellen's office, or four rooms in Paul's office, and he'll be in there tomorrow, or five rooms in my office, or, and so it goes up the corridor. We've got all of our rooms nice and cosy, because Norman and Neil have spent hours here this week. So let's give them a huge, huge thanks. There is so much that goes on, on this, in this building from Sunday through to the next Sunday, and so often uh, it's unseen. We're so grateful for all that everyone does. Now, we're coming to our final miraculous birth um, before that of, of, of celebrating Christmas, of course. Um, and we're going to look at the story um, of Samson today. Now, many of us will be familiar with the story about a hare and a tortoise who decide to have a race. The hare is convinced that he will win, but as it is, the tortoise crosses the finishing line first. And the moral of the story is not that the hare was so much faster, but the patient, steady plodding of the tortoise made it fin to the finish line because he never stopped. He just kept going. And as we come to this third miracle birth character in our Advent series, we're going to discover a man who was far more hair-like in his approach to life than tortoise. Samson is a man who started well with a divine promise over his life. And although he fulfilled that promise, his life story is somewhat of a tragic mess. He was immensely strong around men. He was ridiculously weak in the presence of women. He was fiercely proud and competitive in male company. In female company, he was like putty in their hands. His story is covered in four chapters in the book of Judges, but we're going to focus for a moment on the first chapter of his story, and that's actually in Judges 13. All right, so if you've got a Bible in front of you, maybe one from the back there, we're looking at page 256, and we're going to take some selected verses from chapter 13. And if you're using one of the church Bibles, you will see it's headed, the birth of Samson. So starting at verse 2, a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And we're going to pause there for a moment and we'll come back to some later uh, verses in a moment. Samson's mother was such an ordinary woman. 
She was such an ordinary woman that she isn't even given a name in this story. And yet, the child that she's going to have is going to be part of God's salvation story. From the point of conception, this unnamed ordinary mother-to-be is asked to conform to a steady and a measured life. No alcohol, and she must adhere to a really strict diet. And no haircut for her baby, not ever, because Samson's going to be a Nazarite. And the Nazarite was somebody who was fully devoted to God. And this devotion was demonstrated by observing the strict rules that the angel um, tells her, but also other things like not having any contact with anything dead. Usually this would be for a season, but for Samson, we're told, this is going to be for the whole of his life. And this is because he's been born to bring light into his world. Samson, whose name means Sonny, his destiny is to take a lead in saving God's people from the Philistines, who were the bad guys in this time in history. They were long-term enemies of God's people, and they were really hard to beat at war. But Samson never comes close to fulfilling his potential. Instead of adopting this tortoise-like, steady and persevering characteristic um, as demonstrated by his mother, he, de he develops and displays a cavalier attitude towards his tremendous gifts and high calling. And this is what makes him like the hare. Samson we know breaks at least two of the key Nazarite rules. He allows his hair to be cut and he eats honey from the carcass of a dead lion which he has killed. And I wonder whether he didn't drink alcohol as well because he liked quite a good party. On the scale of how good a Nazarite he was, Samson doesn't finish well, even if at the end of his story, he does bring down the pillars of the Philistine temple, killing himself and many of his enemies too. We live in a hair-like culture, don't we? Where we are obsessed by everything fast. We want immediate results. We want to be up to date with the latest. We don't tolerate being kept waiting. In a business setting, it is the hares who quite often get promoted. They are the ones that are quite often rewarded the most. And in, an, in a recent American survey, burnout was cited as the most, um, the main reason why people quit their jobs in 1920. Do I mean 1921? I mean 2021. And, um, and I suspect it's not a very different story in the UK either. Society shapes us to live like hares. But in Samson's mirac miraculous birth story, we see that God desires for us to develop the characteristics that we more associate with the tortoise. Rather than the quick fix, we're called to a life of steady dedication to the disciplined obedience that wins the race at the end. So as we race towards Christmas this year, I wonder what December has looked like for us. Have we consciously built in time for prayer and reflection as we ready ourselves to receive our King? Or are we dashing through our preparations and to-do list in the hope that we can outrun the days that are rather rapidly ticking by? And is this just a December pace that we live at? Or is actually this the pace that we're living at all year long? The Bible calls us to challenge this hair-like way of living, the hair-like culture all around us. And the Bible says, slow down. To consider what directions our habits and lifestyle might be taking us 
and ask the question, is my pace of life leading me closer or further from a contented life with God? And for the super busy of us, we might be on such a hamster wheel of activity, we don't even know where or how we might be able to stop. Now, the story doesn't tell us that Samson's parents were excited to have a son, but I guess they probably were. What the story does tell us is that they are serious about what they hear. Tim Keller, uh, who's an American pastor and theologian, says, the purpose of a Nazarite vow was to ask for God's special help during a crucial time. It was a sign that you were looking to God with great intensity and focus. Keeping one's hair uncut, refraining from the fruit of the vine were ways of showing that you were in training towards a goal. And Samson's dad, Manoah, would have known this when his wife told him what she'd heard. And his response is to pray, to ask God to reveal himself again because he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to handle being a father of a child with such great promise. And you know, praying is the, um, the most natural response we should have when we don't know what to do. We can ask God to help us to do what he calls us to do. So if life is far too busy for you at the moment, and you know that you need to stop or slow down, can I encourage you to at least pause and pray and say, help. God. We've all got time for that. We're going to continue in the story. We're going to jump down to verse 8, which is still on page 256. And we're going to continue uh, with the story. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born doesn't know what to do. God heard Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife and when he came to the man he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all that I've told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine, nor other fermented drink, nor drink or eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. And so here we have Manoah who wants to be the very best father he can be. But do you notice? It's this ordinary woman who's so ordinary that she isn't named who is given the greatest responsibility for Samson's upbringing. It's an ordinary woman who is so ordinary that she's not named. She, who is the woman that God chooses to be Samson's role model. And how sad it is that Samson rejects this female role model and instead chases after women who prove to be no good for him at all. And isn't this sometimes the way with us? God puts good people across our paths, but we reject the good people that he gives us, people who will help us, people who will support us, and people who will help us grow. These people might be our friends, they might be our small group leader, they might be a counsellor, they might be a work colleague, they might even be a family member. And I'm going to invite Chelsea to come and share a really simple story that she chatted through with me 
uh, one day last week. I'm on the white microphone here, Neil. Uh, so earlier this week, um, I was rushing around. I had tons of chores to do, tons of tasks like to do list like this long. And uh, I put my kids' food on the table. And normally we would sit and we would say a prayer before we eat, but I was so busy and I just it completely slipped my mind. Um, and my daughter, she uh, shouted at us. She was like, sit down, hold my hand, which normally I would have told her I'm shouting, but something told me I needed to listen. Uh, so me and Nina both sat, hold hands with her, and um, she started to pray. Um, we had no idea what she was saying because she was babbling in her own language. And uh, at the end she said, Amen. And we both said, Amen. And I just sat there for a little bit longer and just watched her because she made me stop and realised that I didn't need to be rushing around and um, there was more important things. Thank you. Let's just give um, Chelsea a round of applause. Because it's hard standing up here and sharing our story, but that is a perfect example of a little one being the good person in a family setting saying, stop, pause, slow down. And God will bring people like that across our paths. They may be people that are going to challenge us. They may be people that we commonly call a critical friend. Now that's not somebody that is criticizing and brings us down. That's a criticizing person. But a critical person, a, a critical friend, sorry, is the kind of person that uses good questions to think about a situation and to judge a situation and maybe even offer through questioning correction so that we can fulfill our destiny and our destiny is to be a disciple a perpetual student of Jesus a lifelong learner God calls us each and every one of us to have a teachable heart that is willing to change and learn and that is our destiny until the moment that we take our very final breath. We don't give up when we're 60 or 70 or 80 years old. God calls us to be teachable for the whole of our lives. And it's hard because society often prefers the person with the quick answer the person with the charismatic personality, the person that is the popular one. Society focuses on the goal, the achievements, the destination. But as we see in Samson's life, it's really not wise. The Bible teaches us that we would better focus on the journey. And Jesus challenges us, whoever wants to be my <coughs> disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? And some of us live life chasing things in this world, forgetting that we are in danger of losing the one that is to come. We're called to focus on the journey. And when we do, like the tortoise, we will reach the destination and reach it well. So our destiny is to be tortoise-like. Steady, determined and diligent, humble and hushed. Determined to finish the race without letting our arrogant and <coughs> indulgent and proud hair-like characteristics get in the way. In our fable, the tortoise's eyes are firmly fixed on the finish line and his measured and his steady steps forward keep him on the straight and the narrow path. And that is what we are called to be like. 
The writer of the book of Hebrews says, let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And the Bible warns us against the contrasting attitude of the hare, which is arrogant and boastful and indulgent. In one of the wisdom books in the Bible, in Proverbs, it says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to, pov to poverty. The quick and the confident hare in that story assesses the tortoise inaccurately and his gaze veers off the course and the, the finish line inevitably becomes far from him. So to be tortoise-like, I'm not talking about the scaly skin, but to be tortoise-like in our attitude requires us to respect God like Samson's mother. She believes what God says. She talks about what God has got to say with her husband. She follows God's request. She demonstrates a life of obedience. One of, again, one of the contributors to the wisdom books in the Bible says, respect and obey the Lord. This, he says, is the beginning of wisdom. To have understanding, we must know the holy God. And we see this in Samson's mother, but it is woefully lacking in Samson himself. And Samson's mother has such a good understanding of God. She recognizes that God is both holy, but also loving at the same time. Manoah encounters, when he encounters the angel, he says to the angel, come and stay and have a meal with us. And the angel says, no. But the angel then suggests that he prepares a burnt offering. So we're going to jump to verse 19. Uh, so we've moved on to page 257. Um, and we're going to start at verse 19. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces in the ground, to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized it was the angel of the Lord. We're doomed to die, he told his wife. We've seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. And then the story goes on to say that this unnamed woman gives birth to her son. Samson's mother is perceptive enough to see that God's love is unconditional and wholehearted. And I wonder, is that our understanding of God, holy and yet unconditionally and wholehearted, loving towards us? Or are we fearful of God, like Samson's dad, Manoah, or reckless with regard to God's love, like Samson, his, um, his self? As we reflect on Samson today, I think the inevitable challenge to us is who do we want to be most like? Samson, full of exploits, larger than life, impulsive, impetuous, lurching, lurching from mistake to mistake, the hare. Or do we want to be more like Samson's mother? An ordinary woman, so ordinary, she isn't even named, but she is the steady one like the tortoise. Our destiny is to be spiritually mature and there are no shortcuts to this route. Resisting Samson's hair-like tendencies come from knowing who God is and living obedient to his word, remembering that God himself is holy, praying for wisdom when we don't know what or how 
being open to good and godly people, those that God places across our path so that we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus as we journey through life. So Advent is a season where we are invited to stop, to pause, to assess and maybe to reassess the pace of life and the patterns of our walk with God, maybe to realign our focus on Jesus as we await our coming King. So I'm going to invite you to stand as, uh, as we pray. Um, let's stand. Let's spend a moment reflecting on where we know or sense that we are too busy. Let's stop for a moment and reflect on those things that we sense or know are pushing God to one side and distracting our thinking and our behaviours and our lives. Let's pause before God and allow him to reveal to us those hair-like qualities that are doing us no good at all. And let's ask God to check our spirit. Where might we be saying, but I don't want to be like a tortoise, Lord? And confess that to him. And allow him to reveal a fresh vision for what that journey might look like. Lord, the Bible tells us to press on towards our goal in you, Jesus. Father, we ask you to lead us in obedience in your direction. Lord, we recognize we can be like the hare. But we don't want to be like the hare in the story, always stopping and starting. Lord, we want to move slowly and steadily all the way to the finish line. So, Lord, when we become tired, would you give us rest? When we become discouraged, would you give us hope? When we grow weary, would you give us strength? And, Lord, in all things, would you help us to thank you for every day? Amen.